Thank you. Um, very nice to see you here. Nicely spread out. Uh, it could be a football, uh, pop, um, football crowd, really. But you are, to me, you're my football crowd. Um, as an artist, I really started out with sort of academic beginnings, really. Uh, and perspective um, and certain kind of traditional approaches were quite important to me just as a way of learning, but they became more and more important as time went by uh, and became rather the basis for a kind of uh, practice that uh, started with ideas of materials in the 1960s with my tutors being people involved in um, plastic, the development of plastics, new generation artists dealing with um, uh, volumes of uh, modern materials being cast in fiberglass resin, etc. Some of those materials one sees coming back, even in this exhibition, uh, as a way of trying to establish big, big, big forms and complex forms um, by using mold making, etc., and modern, modern finishing. I've gone increasingly towards a more um, classical uh, expression. And the kinds of things that um, in, in, interested me initially in the point at which I started to exhibit, um, I was starting to break down and analyze the basic principles of what was my making process, whether they be model make, modeling or inscribing or carving. So the two principles of modeling and carving became something that one might see uh, encapsulated here, which may also have an indication of my interest in a certain kind of symmetry in the kind of work you'll see upon the plateau at the moment. This sculpture called uh, Surface uh, Mirror was a piece made at the Palazzo Reale in Milan in about 1979, I think. It was dated somewhere in the previous image. And the thing about this is, if you like, there's a line down the middle of this room. The room on the left was stripped of all its plaster in the palace. And a relief was made of the object on the other side of the room in its space. So this panel leaning against the wall, which was a whole, the end of a whole series of works that I made that were about uh, objects, simple rectangular forms, um, making a reference perspectively through drawing of the space in which the panel rested. So on this panel on the right, you have a perspectival representation of the floor that is occupied by that leaning panel. <clears throat> this particular work going across the Alps and started looking so I started looking at, if you like, illusion to the extent to which uh, I could also play with this game of illusion rather than just in relation to the panel within which my uh, object stood, but also used the whole room to reflect what was on the other side. So there's an idea of trompe l'oeil, there's an idea of architecture, there's an idea of painting. And the kind of guides that I used on my initial sort of grand tours in Italy were the writings of Vasari, the writings of uh, Alberti, um, and a later writer, a very much later writer called Adrian Stokes, who was an English uh, follower of Ezra Pound as a young man traveling around Italy, being completely consumed by the wonders of the Quattrocento. So this stuff captivated me as a conceptual artist, and there was, a, some, be there was some beautiful writing about the ideas of creative processes the creative processes between Northern Europeans who in a cold climate would manipulate and carve in small objects of the hand, whereas in the Mediterranean with the warm sunshine on their backs, artists and architects had a much more expansive, I suppose even Baroque, maybe that was the origin of the Baroque, but in general there was this idea that there was a much more expansive, greater um, uh, vision of what art might be rather than from a cold climate. So I think it's ter been terribly important for so many artists that crossing the Alps from the north was liberating to a very large extent. And obviously began the great grand tour um, uh, um, uh, habit of the rich, uh, and then became, if you like, the, uh, the, 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 um, 
the, 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 the annual um, idea of everybody who wanted a tour across the Alps and visit beautiful countries with beautiful art and beautiful architecture. So this very, very simple work, if you like, encapsulates notions of a simple uh, single point perspective and how they can actually uh, have a, a, a reference to my interest as a, a modernist quasi-conceptual artist. Forgive me, I'm just trying to uh, see how this goes. Okay, you can see here on, the, um, on this picture where the wall was stripped away uh, and replastered by me. Um, hang on, sorry, I'm getting a, a flag up which is telling me to do something which I can't see what I'm supposed to do. Right, okay. Um, and this is how the um, two sides of the room were, were developed as a single object. I keep getting um, a cookie come up or something. There's something I'm doing which causes an extra... Okay, um, hang on. I'm getting an ad block hiding wizard. Okay. Okay, let's see how it goes. I'm sorry. I, I'm not great at this kind of stuff. Okay, so that was in 1979. Um, a part of the, uh, the work that I was doing in Italy um, when I developed my notions of the classical and the contemporary was also to do with the idea of um, fragmentation as being something that had something of a contemporary uh, concern to a lot of artists uh, who were um, looking at how materials were formed just by their, by their own behavior. Um, and I found sort of a res resonances to those kinds of uh, preoccupations with materials uh, in the way that museums deduced all sorts of uh, scenarios and histories from fragments found um, from sites all over the place, whether it was to do with iconoclasm or whether it was to do with um, some kind of a great natural catastrophe. So it's like the idea that history would, can never be lost as long as there was someone interested enough to analyze what was in the ground, you could find, a, you could find out anything. So this is a kind of a lesson about iconoclasm in the sense that uh, no matter what you do to try and destroy something, there will be always someone who can find out exactly what it was and why it was destroyed. This piece called Solia is a piece, and I'm gonna talk about it because it's here. Uh, and um, it's called Solia and it's, it's a, a reference to um, uh, a step in a church uh, in uh, Venice and it deals with an idea of spatiality that a step, a solia, is a threshold into another, another space. So these kinds of illusions and other spaces on the other side of a picture plane, on the other side of a relief, relate to the idea of how um, perspective was developed and um, I suppose created in a constructional sort of way as to how paintings developed after a period of stylization, of, um, of uh, schematic ways of how different things in space, according to their size alone, gave them importance. This piece is... Um, no, it's not doing anything for me now. Sorry. Okay, let's get rid of this. I don't think I'm going to be very good at this. Hang on. Um, it's, it doesn't behave very quickly, I'm afraid. Okay, I'm, I'm here, I know what to do. Okay, okay, forgive me. Um, so what I'm going to do is that uh, I can tell a story and I think this is probably the best way of doing it. Um, when I was in Italy, I mentioned Bazzari. And what I did was I went around to the stone quarries described by Vasari um, as a way of introducing materials and processes, methodologies if you like, for the artists of the Renaissance. And in his great book on the, uh, the artists of the Renaissance, the lives of the artists, there was a preface to this called the, the uh, technique. And in it, he described um, the sources of materials, whether they were to do with um, pigments or whether they were to do with stones or uh, uh, cloth for canvases. 
uh, and different kinds of processes. Um, and one of the, uh, so I more or less uh, visited all the quarries in, in Italy and I made lots of different exhibitions uh, with these different stones, uh, making references to their use in, um, uh, in the history of art. Um, but there was one stone that did not come from Italy and that was imperial porphyry, which became a kind of a, um, a talisman for me uh, because I could find it in Italy, but it was terribly expensive because it was used in the Pietra Dora industry. Um, so by great fortune, I was invited to make a sculpture for the Opera House in Cairo by the British Foreign Office and with a wonderful collaboration with the Ministry of Culture here and the Geological Mining and Mapping Authority of Egypt, I was able to take uh, expeditions to the Eastern Mountains of Egypt, where I was allowed to uh, look for and uh, take some materials. Um, and I've just been today um, to, uh, to look at how my sculpture is faring outside the Opera House. And besides being covered in sand, it's still there. It's still two massive lumps of porphyry, which if you like are a collaboration between me uh, and, and um, Roman carvers, probably Egyptian or Greek, um, who did some work roughing uh, these pieces of raw stone out. So here you've got the beginnings of my activities with imperial porphyry from Jebel de Khan the Easter, in the eastern mountains of Egypt. Um, the hardest stone in the world, it became a special preserve of imperial Rome. And these, this stone, which is um, extraordinary uh, in its um, age, its uh, source is a volcanic material often described in early writings as a tooth, but completely unlike the tufo you find in general, I think you find uh, examples of it in Egypt, but you cut it with a saw. Um, in Italy, you find it all over southern Italy, lots of buildings being built out of it because it's sort of an early form of um, uh, industrial um, re recycled material, which is lightweight blocks. Um, but here, uh, I was working on a, a piece for the opera, so I had a problem of what to do as, an, uh, as a contemporary artist coming to a, another country, another culture, and how to proceed with what would be appropriate uh, for a public sculpture. So I found in my principles of what I was looking at, one, it was an opera house, so there's a sense of um, there being great stories uh, with great um, beginnings, um, like Aida and uh, in, in Egypt, um, the new opera house, the old opera house, which was built for, to celebrate the, um, celebrate the opening of the Suez Canal. Um, and the other thing, of course, is the great um, uh, ideas, which preoccupy me as well, which is to do with how great cultures have had the most amazingly imaginative ideas of the afterlife. So the piece that I initially began with, which is called Chrysalis, which now is in the Tate Collection in, uh, in London, was to do with the idea of um, the chrysalis as being a transition between one state of life and another. So it has notions of an afterlife, an idea of resurrection, an idea of that sort of common with uh, pharaonic um, Islamic and, uh, and Christian uh, concepts. So this is this piece here. Um, and then this uh, piece in the middle, which is called um, Study for Song. <laughs> and then this piece, little piece is called Solo. As you can see, it's a piece of about um, 60 uh, centimeters high uh, in um, the porphyry that I'm talking about. And the pieces here are at the Opera House in Cairo. And they're still there. And I think there might be a better if I just do that, that's good. But my, my preoccupation with um, uh, Egypt wasn't eventually just this uh, commission. But in meeting a wonderful um, geologist uh, at the Geological Mining and Mapping Authority called Dr. Atif Dardir, who was known by his uh, students as the, the knower of every stone in Egypt, uh, told me of some other amazing stones in, uh, in Egypt and um, uh, directed me towards, um, let's go to the top again, directed me towards Hammamat Breccia, which is from perhaps the oldest stone quarry in the world. 
uh, which is between um, Kuft and Kosir, and um, okay, good. This is nice. Okay, and um, this is the stone in an exhibition at the uh, British Museum. Oh, that's in the Tate Gallery. Uh, it's called Flask. The idea of a vessel being a repository for the soul or the spirit. Where's that gone? Oh, here we are, sorry. Uh, this is, uh, again, this is in the British Museum in an exhibition, um, what was it called? Time Machine, done, done by a young curator called James Putnam. And this exhibition was then uh, transferred to the Egyptian Museum in Turin, uh, parts of it anyway. Um, but this stone is just extraordinary, and um, it's very, very, well, it's, it's a breccia. It's made of many, many stones with a, with a matrix of, uh, I think, gray wacky. Uh, and the stones are like bright pebbles, and it has a most amazing sort of uh, complex and beautiful life, which sometimes in a sculpture like this, come to me, oh, come to me, hang on. Um, sorry, I'll just see if it'll take me down the road. No, it won't. Okay. Um, so um, I worked on, a, on several pieces, and, and I suppose you could say that the sculpture that preempts um, the uh, piece on the plateau is this piece, which is made in Hamelat Breccia, which was the first of the, in, of, the in, of the interior space sculptures, as I call them, which deal with a kind of a, a physical idea of a, of a contained space. Come on. And, and the idea as well that was particularly influential in the way that these, uh, this idea developed was, were the tombs of the Apis bulls in uh, Saqqara, in the, in the, in the Serapeum. So this sculpture here is now at Houghton Hall, which is a big uh, stately home in, uh, in London, uh, sorry, in England, in Norfolk, and is now a, a place where there some amazing um, uh, contemporary sculpture shows take place. Um, this, this piece was, for me, a marriage of my interest in a minimal kind of uh, formalism. And in some respects, it has the most amazing spatial quality that the field of all the brecciated stones can sometimes feel like a Monet painting of Giverny with a, like a lake of lilies or, or, um, or um, um, yeah, a lake of lilies, yeah. Uh, but the, most, the, the thing that particularly uh, uh, captivated me was that by total coincidence, um, there, was, there was this uh, white line of quartz embedded in the stone throughout the block. And the way the block was cut, uh, and then, if you like, it was then um, or orchestrated to work like perspective, uh, perspective. So the business of my interest in perspective was then reinforced by this kind of three-dimensional pathway, which is taken by the door through into the sculpture as a, as a pathway. And around with the sculpture itself, you have a kind of a continuation of this line, which has different kinds of characteristics. In one sense, it can be like a pathway, and in others, like a description of a valley or something. And the, the top is actually the, 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 the um, crust of the earth, um, organized to be as if the stone was cut by a laser and lifted out of the ground, so the roof which is about 14 tons, sits on top the rest of the stones, which weigh about eight tons. Um, and it's four meters long, two and a half meters high. So, so, so it's not working out this. Um, okay, so that's in a, in, in a natural, um, environment which is very much like a like a cathedral really so it's a very uh, opportune sort of site for this kind of work 
Come on, baby, come on. No, I'm just not, I'm not master. oh, here we are. I'm not mastering it. Uh, okay, uh, these are some more pieces that are a bit like the, um, the, the flask sculpture, which I showed you previously, which is just another example of this beautiful stone breccia uh, from uh, Hammamat. Go away. Okay, forget that. No, I can't, um, I just can't get the, um, I can't get the, uh, Yeah, of course, you know exactly what's wrong, don't you? <laughs> Thank you. I'm not going to get that back either. Get to the top. Here we are, sorry. Here we go. I'll go back to Egypt. So amongst the things I was making were figures, um, the attributes of saints, like the griddle to St. Lawrence, uh, an altar for a church in, in London, which had been burnt down, and I, I made this altar for, for the church. And um, that was made here in Marmo Neal factory uh, in um, Nasser City. So these things are, have got great, I hope, Byzantine resonance. Uh, this stone really hasn't been used since the sixth century, I suppose. The quarries were closed, uh, I suppose, at the end of the Roman Empire. Uh, it hasn't really been used since then. And these were um, the rough blocks that I used to make this altar. Uh, which is, um, stands on these kind of ir um, irregular, these irregular legs of uh, Hammamat Breccia. This is the inside of the church. The Reredos is also by me. Um, it's, a, it's a crucifixion in, uh, in several parts in which the negative spaces represent the cross, crosses upon which, were, uh, upon which were born the bodies of Christ and the, and the uh, thieves. Um, the Golgotha is seen as the place of the skull, but also as a, uh, a kind of the land of the, of the Mediterranean. And the view is from behind the cross, uh, looking across the Mediterranean, Mediterranean to Rome. Um, all the ar artifacts in the church were made by me, except one small um, work made by a, an assistant of mine. So this, this is a font which is made of pieces from the altar. Okay, so the, uh, the icon is quite invisible here <laughs> as well. Okay, I'll, still, I'll stick with Egypt <laughs> and I uh, hope we can go down. Oh, the other thing um, I wanted to say in relation to the sculpture at the pyramids, uh, I'll just show you this stuff first, I suppose, because they are in time. Um, this piece is another sculpture made of... Um, Imperial Porphyry from Mons Porphyrites, um, and it's um, a piece called uh, Dreadnought Problems of History, The Search for the Hidden Stone. And it's here standing on the cataract um, at the, um, uh, at the uh, stately home uh, of Chatsworth in uh, Derbyshire in England. And it was a, a fantastic opportunity to place uh, the sculpture in such a again a classical site and the idea within the work wow that's good um, the idea within the work was that the in the search for the hidden stone was that it was a highly um, brecciated piece of stone with a lot of uh, gray tooth in it and the idea was to excavate out the gray tooth to expose the prize porphyry so the irregular irregularity of it is if you like a a product of the of the process. Those are the contemporary uh, aspects of my uh, work uh, coming to the fore in that case. Yeah. I hope I've left you something decent to look at while I'm fiddling here. Okay. Um, okay. Now. One of the things that is 
been so important to me um, about this exhibition uh, was being invited to show on the plateau and being able to choose to show my work next to the uh, Pyramid of Khafre. Kefren, as I've always called him. Um, because one of the stones that I was particularly interested in finding, uh, which I was directed to by Dr. Atif Dardir, who sadly died last year, um, was the source of Kefren diorite, which is near the Sudan border in the, uh, beyond um, Abu Simbel. And I took a, an expedition there, just as a reconnaissance expedition, and I, I acquired a few smaller pieces of the material from which the, I think probably the greatest uh, piece of sculpture that's come to us from antiquity, which is, is, the, is the funerary statue of Kefren, which we see in the archeological museum, if it's still there or going to be uh, sited at the new archeological museum, GEM or whatever. Um, it's the most amazing thing that I hope you've all seen. If not, you can look at a 10 pound note and you can see at least the head with the Horus Hawk protecting the back of this great pharaoh in this most amazing portrait, which is so real as a human, a representation of a human being, you know, not really uh, matched until we get to the Roman era of fantastic portraiture and sculpture. So this piece, the, this piece um, here um, is one with these sort of surfaces are the are the surfaces of wind-blown sand that have sculpted through uh, the millennia um, the stone lying on the ground and these uh, these are three views of one sculpture called the figure of Cafre which you can see the kind of quality and the um, probably the recognizable quality of the uh, of that stone and uh, another here is, come to me. Why are you not going? I'm at the top, I'm at the top. I got it, 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 I got it. Um, I, I'm persevering here because I, these mean so much to me, these, uh, these figures. And um, this is one called uh, the seed of, seed of Kefren, which is a wall hanging piece. It's obviously phallic, but it's just like a, a fragment from a colossal sculpture that you might have found made by the Romans, or even the Egyptians, for goodness sake. I think they invented colossals, colossi. Um, and so I'm now, I'm now off the, my site altogether. So, um, I think probably I'd like to do a little bit more. Can you, someone come and help me get back? There are just a couple of other things from the Egyptian side. Just in terms of, um, I suppose, the, the monumentality of the material, uh, this, this was a, a commission from, again, the, the British government. It was from the British, um, the gov British government art collection. And this sculpture is, there, okay. Uh, this sculpture is a, um, it, it's a war memorial in Canberra in Australia um, for which there was no uh, a representation or a, a monument for British and Australian dead in, in Canberra of all places. It's the city of war memorials. Um, and this is, if you like, a, a cenotaph of sorts. It's an inside out kind of sculpture because the the interior of the space is the outside of what was the boulder from which it was made. And the boulder was created, cut, mitered, and turned inside out to become this a monument in a stone that was a prized stone in antiquity, uh, it having been uh, um, uh, sought after by great kings of Persia. Uh, Darius, Xerxes the Great, sent expeditions there and Philip of Macedon also. And there's graffiti on the walls of the quarries uh, which show the, um, uh, the, the, um, the tasks set for the, uh, for the people who were sent to procure stone. I don't know what the evidence is of these things ever going back to those countries, but there is a, uh, it's, there's an amazing um, uh, traffic in materials in ancient, the ancient world 
because there were, um, even in Eastern Anatolia, beyond Turkey, there's evidence of copies of the stones of Egypt coming from the time of Zoser, because there's evidence in the pattern making of certain aspects of uh, um, rooms in Zoser's tomb that are copied by painting, uh, like a kind of uh, faux painting of these amazing stones that were around in the ancient world. There's an amazing new book by one professor, Fabio Barry, uh, called Painting in Stone, which has recently been published. Happens to be my son-in-law, but I don't really want to admit to any kind of nepotism, whatever. Okay, okay. Um, I'm going through eruptions here, and that is completely invisible. No, it's not? Okay. Stay with me. <laughs> There'll be fireworks at the end. Um, okay. Um, okay. All right. I'll just show a couple of other things just that show how Egypt has really inspired so many of things that I've done. This was a sculpture that was made for a collector in Siwa, uh, an English man who built a house in Siwa. Um, and this is called Oracle, as you can see. And the relationship is, if you like, between the idea that Alexander the Great went to Siwa. He probably heard about it from his dad. So the fact that this was a stone sought after by, by Philip of Macedon. Um, and it's actually uh, a stone that should have been set up in the uh, oasis. Um, and there's a sounding box underneath it that water would have run through. But there was a dispute between my commissioning uh, patron and uh, the person who owned the land upon which the sculpture was to stand. So it's now at Marmo Nil uh, as a piece of <laughs> sculpture waiting to be decided. And these are some uh, small drawings uh, that show that I do do some small things as well. They're collage pieces. And um, then there is another, because I'd like to show that the, the idea of the, um, the sarcophagi is something that uh, captured my imagination so much that besides the piece in the middle here, there was another piece that was commissioned by the person who commissioned the Siwa uh, oracle piece, um, which is this one, which is called uh, Interior Space, Blood of the Gazelle. And this is a, a beautiful red Egyptian granite. And the erratic, if you like, um, what would one call it? Um, inclusion in jewelry, but it's rather big to call it that. But this is what gave the idea of the blood of the gazelle. It's like a, a shot being fired into a body and the, the bleeding of this shape, which um, is, exists around the stone. And this is next to the Arnolfini Gallery in the center of Bristol, my home city. And the, the church, which was my, church school uh, behind it, St. Mary Reckliffe, the fairest and godliest parish church in all England, according to Queen Elizabeth I. So, okay, that's cool, I think. Um, so, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll just have one more uh, go at getting it, uh, this going, and then uh, maybe if I can just sort of summarize, I'd just like this to be something. Keep coming, come on, come on, come on. I'm just clumsy, I think. <laughs> I can't get the, uh, just the, um, the, the sidebar is not, not going up. I just want to get back up to that little menu. Uh, yeah, there it is, thank you. Okay, shukran. So I'm afraid your, um, your recording of a lecture is going to be rather <laughs> stultified. <laughs> Um, okay, so, okay, these are some rather lovely pieces in uh, Egyptian alabaster. Um, they were, uh, to keep the theme of Egypt and how it's inspired so many things that I've done, um, the, the, these things like this, this, this suite of work um, are a suite of work called After the sculptor of the um, 
of the uh, court of Akhenaton and Nefertiti, and he was called Beck. And I named these, uh, uh, this series of sculptures Beck after him. And interestingly, uh, for all the elegance I think that these things might contain, I've come across an amazing uh, image of Beck and his wife on the internet recently. He was a short, fat guy with an even bigger, just slightly taller, fatter wife. And um, thinking of how elegant the court of Akhenaton and Nefertiti were, uh, I was very, very surprised to find, uh, find this. The, 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 the amazing uh, place that these images are shot in, this was an exhibition I did at my local castle of Ludlow in Shropshire, which was created by my wife, Judy, who created a number of uh, shows of sculpture in this uh, fantastic uh, Norman um, edifice. Okay, right, nearly there, and I'll put you out of your misery. And come on, there we go. Oh, okay. Oh, would have helped if I'd been going in the right direction. Uh, good. Um, I have done this before. I, I didn't seem to have the same ineptitude, I'm afraid. Come on, baby. Oh, no, I don't want you. Here we go. Sorry, this will be it. Okay. I'll just try and uh, wind up with this. Well, maybe I won't wind up with that. Um, I, I will. I, I'll talk. I just. I'll just talk about these two things because I suppose they. They finish on the. Um, on the uh, theme of. Um, of alabaster, um, but these these are called cycladic Gemini. Uh, the idea of twins, of pairings, are uh, a subject which uh, I, I follow in quite a lot of sculpture, and these two. Uh, figures which are about six and a half feet, sort of two meters high, um, were from the same block of uh, alabaster, which was not necessarily a kind of alabaster you'd find in, used in decorative material. A very, not particularly uh, lusciously marked, but it had some fantastic marking in it and some wonderful kind of uh, travertine-esque sort of holes in it, which were very, very beautiful to work with. Um, and this was shown recently at the Royal Academy. Um, but this pairing and, and the idea of mirroring, which is the thing I was introducing with that first picture, which was called relief mirror, um, is something which is in evidence on the plateau with the way that I deal with a block of stone. Uh, I went to the quarries in Aswan uh, with uh, Robin Abdullah, the son of uh, the owner. And in the quarry, there were three enormous blocks that had been taken out of the quarry to clear the quarry because they weren't really of any interest as being material they could use for the market. So I knew there would be something in there for me. And so the piece up on the, uh, on the plateau uh, is made from, a, let's say, a reject block of stone. But the way that it's be, been um, created from the Big Bang from the kind of agglomeration of great clouds of dust and stone and rock. It was drawn together in the creation. And all the pressure and the heat that was in the middle of this kind of revolving mass became boiling granite, stone, whatever. And because I think this stone is in the bottom of what was as a quarry that's been going since the time of Kefren, because Kefren's sarcophagus, which is a small thing about just, just uh, as big as a modern man, maybe seven feet by a meter wide, is in uh, red Aswan granite. Uh, and I wanted to make an edifice, uh, not an edifice, I wanted to make a sarcophagus for, uh, in honor of Kefren, this great uh, hero of mine. Um, and so the sculpture itself is, if you like, my homage to Kefren as a sarcophagus worthy of such a great pharaoh who had a fantastic sculpture made for him. He must have had a court himself of amazingly talented people and obviously a lot of hardworking guys to build that pyramid. But anyway, thank you. I'm sorry it was such a stuttering performance, but uh, forgive me for that.
Uh, poor, poor, I, have to, I have to say porphyry, because no one's used it for several hundred years at least, and I suppose if they have used it, they've used it from sources that the Romans brought into Rome or took to Constantinople. And um, by going to Mons Porphyrites and being at the time given permission to take some, uh, I, some of which I still have in my possession, like the dreadnought sculpture, uh, I still have a, a passion for it because it's the hardest stone in the world. And I have to respect it because it took a chunk out of my arm. And um, so I kind of have to love it for, for that, those kinds of reasons. But I don't really have a favorite material. I think probably what drives my work is if you like the, and that's the reason I choose hard stones particularly, like the Pharaoh's Joe's granite. It was like that they're, uh, their bar could actually stay and live forever. And when the Romans came along and found porphyry, which was harder by far, I thought, well, maybe the Romans were trying to, you know, um, find some of Roman emperors were trying to find something uh, that would make their uh, images last for even longer. Um, but when it comes to the, like the reason for using uh, granite, these are the first actual granite pieces I've ever made. And besides that piece on the on the plateau. Uh, I've got four other blocks which have yielded about four, uh, 30 slabs and they are absolutely mind-blowing in terms of the kind of patterning. So extraordinary. You, couldn't, you could never invent it you know, on a, if you were an action painter. So I love that. I, I'm working on some um, white marble at the moment from the uh, Michelangelo uh, quarry in Carrara. I'm working on a series of tondos, uh, if you like, inspired by the tondo that the Royal Academy that I'm a member of owns, uh, the Tade tondo. Um, and so, and the hammer mat breccia is just the most beautiful, beautiful material. And the extraordinary thing is, because it's not so consistent as a material, it's still in the ground because commercially it's sort of unviable, which is such a wonder, really. I'm so pleased, you know. And, Catherine Darwright is something maybe, maybe if on, a, on a, my next trip I might speak to a minister and try and make a plea about being able to set up my expedition that I had planned some time ago to visit it and take something big enough to do something special with. Uh, it's a very big question, I'm sorry, which is um, yeah, that's interesting, really. Uh, I think the thing about, I, I suppose we, we've forgotten that uh, the great carvers always had a lot of help. Um, I'm, Michelangelo's diaries, for example, set up that um, he might want a stooping figure, uh, a bending figure, a tall figure, crouching figure. And so the quarrymen would actually do quite a lot of shaping. Uh, apparently, apparently the raison d'etre for this is that it was so expensive to move stone around, you'd get as much taken off at the quarry as possible. So even Michelangelo, you know, kind of used uh, other people's skills to get to a certain point. You know, I work in India where I work with uh, temple carvers and my kind of um, conceit there is that I can actually work in an ancient uh, technique today uh, using uh, carvers who are still carving idols and carving temples. And so they have a certain skill set, which is still much like the skill sets of two and a half thousand years ago here. Uh, working with some guys who, uh, who were working for me, some, which I got from a contractor, they weren't carvers as such. They were laborers that had worked on the Aswan Dam. So they knew about whacking, getting stones generally sort of squarish. That was about as far as their skills went. But it was good enough to know that they knew how to make chisels with forging them. Um, and it was good enough that they were 
some of them. One of, one of them, I, 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 Mr. Ali, uh, Ali Ahmed, he was called, uh, must have been a carver in, for the pharaohs in ancient times because he had a, he had a skill set and he is, uh, had a, an ability beyond just being able to knock stone about. Um, but skills and, um, uh, are, are just fast disappearing. Um, the men I've worked with in India for the last 30 years are now using diamond tip cutting machines, manual ones, uh, and it means that the kind of control you have going through to get form uh, is disappearing fast because you don't necessarily have to learn uh, the trade right from the beginning, from rough work to fine work, before you can actually start carving an idol. I mean, you give a kid a machine and he'll start carving away until someone clouts him around the ear and says, right, that's enough, you give that to me and I'll do something with it. So there's a, a loss a loss of um, the kind of traditional process of how someone learns their trade. But using machines can be actually uh, controlled well. And the modern, there's nothing new in art, there's nothing new in technology. The big saws that cut big blocks of stone are, 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 are cut in exactly the same way the Romans used to do it. The, the Romans had um, frame saws that were driven by water. Um, they had blades that were fed with sand. You can go to Marma Nil Quarry, you'll see a flywheel which is about four meters in diameter and probably weighs about four tons. And that is driving a piston. And that piston is driving a frame which has got maybe 40 blades in it and it's cutting through blocks three meters long two feet high, and they're going, cha 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 and they're going 24 hours a day. And it takes a, like a week to get through the block. But it's the same technique, but it's a different delivery. Okay? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you.